Hey everyone, the Sony a7S III that I'm filming on right now is an amazing camera, but it can be a bit overwhelming if you've just got it or you're struggling to set it up and you don't really know what best settings to use to get the best possible video quality out of this camera. In this tutorial, I'm gonna show you all of the major things that you need to know to set up your camera and start filming amazing looking video. So let's kick off this tutorial by looking at some of the essential things that you need to set up when getting started with this camera. After you've attached the lens, insert a charge battery and put in a memory card, turn the camera on and open out the screen. Then go and turn the control dial around until you get to movie mode. Press the menu button. The first thing you're going to want to do is decide on if you want PAL or NTSC frame rates available to you. For example, if you set the camera to NTSC, you can choose 24, 30, 60 or 120 frames per second. If you set it to PAL, you can choose 25, 50 or 100 frames a second. The available frame rates will also depend on other settings, but don't worry about that for now. If this sounds a bit like gibberish to you and you're not shooting a project for a specific client or a client that has specific frame rate requirements, just go and set the camera to NTSC and choose 24 frames per second. The next thing you need to do is choose what kind of video file will be saved to the memory card. You can choose to shoot in HD resolution or 4K resolution. HD will be easier to edit if you don't have a powerful computer, but 4K will give you crisper looking footage. HD files will be smaller, 4K files will take up more space on the memory card. 4K files will let you zoom in a little bit during editing without losing as much video quality. You also need to choose how the video file will be compressed in the camera. XAVCHS will write smaller video files, but they'll be a lot harder to edit unless you've got a powerful computer. XAVCS will create larger files, but they might be a bit easier to edit. XAVCSI will create big files, but they'll be the easiest to edit with. To start off, we're going to set this to XAVCS 4K. Remember that there's a lot of different things to think about when choosing these settings, and this is only a beginner's video. As you become more experienced and learn more, you may need to go and tweak these settings. Next, in movie settings, set the recording frame rate to 24p. This means 24 frames per second. Next, in the record setting menu, choose what quality you want the video to be. 100m means 100 megabits for every second of video you record. 60m means 60 megabits per second. 100m will create larger video files that will be harder to edit on your computer without using something like proxies, but that's another discussion for another video. The numbers after the M dictate how much color information will be stored. Choosing 422 10-bit will give you the absolute best color data in the video file, but may be extremely hard to edit on your computer. 4208 bit might not be as hard to edit on your computer, but you might not be able to edit the colors quite as well. Because we're setting the camera up for maximum image quality in this video, we're going to choose 100M 422 10-bit color. There's a few different ways the camera can record color and brightness information into the video files. In this video, we're gonna set up the camera to be able to record the maximum range of dark to light information. Head to the exposure color menu, and choose color tone. Under picture profile, choose PP8 and tap OK. This will set your camera up to use something called S-Log3. When you set your camera up to use S-Log3, it's going to record a flatter, low contrast looking video file that you can then bring back in the editing to really get the maximum dynamic range out of the camera. I'll show you how to do this later in the video when we come to look at editing. Because S-Log3 will look flat in the monitor, to get a better idea of what the final video will look like, head down to the setup menu, choose display option, and turn on gamma display assist. Now the monitor will look a bit more normal. This doesn't affect the recorded video file, it's just to help with monitoring. Next we're going to look at exposure and metering. Under the shooting menu, shooting mode setting, set the exposure mode to manual and hit OK. Change the ISO to 640 and then set the shutter speed to 1 50th of a second. You can now change the aperture until the meter reading says about plus 1.7. This means we're overexposing what the meter thinks we should do 
by 1.7. The reason for this overexposure is to get the best noise performance from the PP8 S Log3 setting we chose earlier. Your lens might also have an aperture ring on it. Setting this to A will let you control the aperture with the camera dial. Now press the FN button and choose white balance. You can choose a manual one such as daylight if you're shooting outside and it's sunny. You can also set this to AWB, which means auto white balance. Using this setting, the camera will try and guess what the white balance setting should be. Ideally though, you want to use a manual setting. Because in the studio here, I'm using daylight balanced lights, we're going to set this to daylight and hit OK. Now just choose whether to use manual or autofocus on your lens and press the record button to start shooting. So you're not always going to be able to keep that meter reading exactly stable and still at a specific setting unless you're working indoors with fixed lighting like I am now. If you're outdoors, perhaps you're vlogging, then you're going to see that meter reading moving around all over the place. If that's the case, then you're going to either want to set an exposure so you get a kind of average meter reading somewhere within that range, or you might have to turn on some of the auto exposure features such as auto ISO. The a7S III has some really useful features that can make using it for video so much easier. Let's take a look at 11 of these next. Normally when you're recording, you just get this little indicator here. You can make it more obvious. What you need to do is go to the menus, head down to shooting display, choose Emph Disp during record, turn this on. And now next time you record, you'll get this big red box, making it a lot easier to see if you're actually recording or not. This is gonna make sure you're actually recording and don't miss any shots. Out of the box, whenever you start or stop recording, you get a really annoying noise. If you want to turn these recording noises on and off, come into the menu, go down to settings, scroll down, go to sound option, choose audio signals, and then set this to off. The A7S III has dual native ISOs. So for example, in S-Log3, the base ISO is 640. This is what it looks like. This is where you're gonna get the least noise. And for S-Log3, the dual base ISO is at 12,800. I've got an entire video dedicated to this, which I'll link to in the description. If we just go slightly underneath the second base ISO of 12,800, for example, 10,000 ISO, notice we've got more noise here, but as soon as we switch to 12,800, that noise disappears. If you've made loads of customizations to your a7S III, you may want to back up the entire camera settings to an SD card. Come into the menus, head down to settings, choose reset or save settings, choose save load settings, choose save, choose save new, enter a file name and then choose save. This will save your settings to the SD card. You can then load the settings at a later date. Just choose load, choose the file, choose OK. This will reset the camera and load the settings file with all of your customizations. You can use this to share settings between friends or have multiple setups for different jobs. If you're liking these tips so far and you want to support the channel, please go and subscribe and turn on notifications. If you're running multiple different cameras, you can customize how the file names are recorded to those cameras. By default, we just get this C number followed by a sequence number. To change this, go into the menus, head to the shooting menu, Choose file, choose file settings, choose file name format. And here you can choose between the standard, which is just to have a C and then a sequence number, or you can choose title, date plus title, or title plus date. Choose title and then head into title name settings. Here you can set a prefix for the file name. So for example, you could set this to A7S3, choose OK, choose OK again. And the next time you record a clip, the file name will be prefixed with A7S3. You can customize how quickly the camera transitions between different autofocus points. To do this, head into the menus, head into the focus menu, choose AF-MF, and then choose AF transition speed. A setting of one is the slowest and seven is the fastest. So at a setting of one, notice how slowly the autofocus transitions, and back again. And if we choose the maximum of seven, Notice how quickly the autofocus changes now. If you're working with manual focus and you want to double check that the focus is bang on, head into the menus, head into the focus menu, head to focus assistant, choose focus magnifier, and then you get this red box. You can move this around on the screen, tap the middle of the dial, and this will zoom into that area. And then you can use manual focus in to check that you're spot on. If you're making use of IAF, the autofocus system will automatically lock onto either the left or right eye. If you're using a lens with a shallow depth of field, you might want to select a specific eye, just so you focus on the near side or the far side eye, depending on the look you're going for. To do this, head into the menus, choose the focus menu, choose face IAF, 
choose right left eye select and then you can select either the right or left eye and the autofocus point will stick to either the right or left eye. Once again this can be useful if you're working with a shallow depth of field. You can customise the autofocus system in the A7S III and decide how responsive it is to changes in subjects or how much it stays locked on to a single subject. To do this head into the menus, head into the focus menu, head into AFMF, choose AF subject shift sensitivity and choose a value of 1 to be more locked on. This will make it less responsive to changes in subjects. So you can see here the book is actually not focusing at all now, it's trying to stay locked on to my face which is behind the book. And you can see it stayed locked onto my face there. If we change this to the maximum value of 5, it's going to be more responsive now to changes in subject. So it's tracking my eyes, hold the book up, it switches to the book, switches back to my eye. So that's highly responsive autofocus subject shifting. The A7S III has a feature called shockless white balance which allows you to set how quickly changes in white balance are reflected in the video. Here it's set to off if we have a look at this and we'll go and make some changes to the white balance here. Notice that when we change the white balance setting the change is almost instantaneous in the video. So this can be quite jarring to the viewer. If we set shockless white balance to slow it's going to be a more gentle transition between white balance changes. Once again we'll make some changes in the white balance. Notice when I shift white balances that the change is more subtle now and it gradually changes to the different white balances. The A7S III has a USB-C input which is behind this door here and this USB-C input also allows you to provide power to the camera over USB. So let's plug this in and you can see up here that we're providing power with this little icon. This means you can shoot for longer if you've only got one battery. The battery will discharge more slowly. Just bear in mind that you do actually need a battery in the camera for this to work. You can't just plug a USB-C power delivery cable in without a battery. And as an added bonus, you can also charge the battery when the camera's turned off via USB-C if you've got an appropriate cable, AC adapter or power bank. So zebras or zebras, depending on where in the world you're from, allow you to set up your exposure with a bit more certainty. Basically they show up like the pattern that you'd see on a zebra for specific areas of specific brightness when you're looking at your LCD or through the viewfinder. There's a couple of options you can choose from when setting custom zebras in the camera. Let's take a look at these next. What's the difference between lower limit and standard plus range modes? Let's go and take a look at this. First thing you need to do is head into the menus for your camera and then head down to zebra settings. In the A7S III here you need to come down to the exposure colour menu, head across and then come down to zebra display. Make sure Zebra Display is turned on here, and then head into Zebra Level. You can see here that you can choose from a number of predefined zebras, from 70 all the way up here to 100 plus, and you've also got this Custom 1 and Custom 2 zebra setup. Let's head into Custom 1, and notice here you can set two different modes. You can either set Lower Limit or Standard plus Range mode. Let's start off with the Lower Limit mode. When you're using Lower Limit, you can set a zebra value all the way up to 109 plus and all the way down to 50 plus. So what does this lower limit mode do? Basically the lower limit mode will show zebras for anything in the scene that's above the limit that you set. So we've set a lower limit here of 50 plus, if we just OK that and come back to our view, you can see we've got zebras on most of the lighter areas. If we go and increase the exposure of this image, for example with ISO, notice that as we increase the exposure, zebras appear on more and more areas of the image. And that's because it's going to show us zebras for anything more than 50. And as we continue to increase the exposure, we get more and more zebras. And if we keep going, we'll eventually get zebras covering the whole screen. Let's just reset this back to ISO 640. Let's head back into the menu and once again into zebra level. And this time, rather than lower limit mode, we're going to choose standard plus range mode. Once again, we're going to set the zebra level at 50. But notice here we can actually go lower here. All the way down to zero but we'll set it at 50 and we also get this additional option this plus or minus value let's start off with plus or minus one basically what this will do now is it will show zebras at 50 plus or minus one so basically from 49 to 51 let's hit ok we can see we've got a few zebras here let's once again go and increase the exposure by increasing the iso but notice now as we increase the ISO, we're not getting zebras cover the whole screen, we're just getting zebras in that band of exposure, 49 to 51. And once again we can keep going up, and we're only going to get zebras for that band of exposure. And if we go all the way up here, notice we don't have zebras covering the screen. Let's just head back to ISO 640, and we'll head back into the zebra setup. 
Rather than choose plus one, let's instead choose a wider range and we can go all the way up to plus or minus 10. What we're going to get now are zebras for anything at 50 plus or minus 10. So basically anything in the exposure range 40 to 60, we're going to get zebras show up. Let's hit OK. Notice now we're getting a lot more zebras on the screen because we've increased the range of exposure where zebras will appear. Once again, let's increase the exposure by using ISO. And as we head up here, we see zebras covering more of the scene. Anything from 40 to 60 will show zebras. So that's the difference between lower limit and standard plus range modes when you're setting custom zebras on your Sony camera. The a7S III has some great stabilization features built into it, which means sometimes you might not even have to use a gimbal when you're filming handheld. The camera's got three main stabilization settings, steady shot standard, steady shot active, and you can also use gyroscopic stabilization. Steady shot standard uses the IBIS in the camera and basically moves around the sensor a little bit to try and remove some of those micro shakes or micro jitters. The steady shot active mode can be used when you've got a bit more motion or a bit more activity in the scene or the camera's moving around a bit more. For example, if you're walking and doing a vlogging type shot, just bear in mind that when you're using steady shot active, it does kind of zoom in a little bit and it adds a 1.1 crop. So your wider angle image is going to look a little bit narrower. You might also get some weird jumps with steady shot active if you move the camera around too quickly. The third form of stabilization that the camera supports is gyro or gyroscopic stabilization. This method of stabilization actually records the movements of the camera into the video file. You can then use that data in the video file during editing to stabilize the footage. In this video, I'm going to show you the four different stabilization options available in the Sony a7S III, so you can decide which one you like the best. Let's have a look now at some side-by-side -side examples of the running test. Check out how good the active and gyro stabilization is here. And as a bonus example, take a look at this version where I've added extra stabilization in post. I've used Warp Stabilizer in Premiere Pro here. Notice how it smooths out things a bit more, but it also does crop in a bit more as well. As a quick tip, if you're using a lens on this camera that doesn't automatically send data such as the focal length to the camera, so for example a manual focus vintage lens, then you're going to have to go into the menu system and you're going to have to choose a manual focal length for the steady shot settings. Otherwise the stabilization might not work how you expect it to. If you want to use the gyroscopic stabilization feature that this camera supports, you're going to need to use a free bit of software from Sony called Catalyst Browse. Let's take a look next at how you use this software to stabilize footage. So the a7S III can capture gyroscopic data as part of the video recording. This data can be used to stabilize the footage later on. This is different from using something like Warp Stabilizer in post to stabilize the footage because the actual physical camera movement can be used during the stabilization process. Warp Stabilizer on the other hand has to try and guess what the movement of the camera was. Normally when shooting video your shutter speed will be roughly double your frame rate. So for 24p you'd be using about 1 48th of a second for your shutter speed. This is to create a pleasing motion blur in the video. If you plan on using gyro stabilization in post, you'll need to shoot at a higher shutter speed to actually reduce motion blur for the stabilization process. For example, this footage was shot at 24 frames per second with a 1 200th of a second shutter speed. 
This means the footage doesn't look as pleasing to the eye, but later in this video I'll show you a trick on how to add the motion blur back in. If you're planning to use gyro stabilisation, you should also turn off stabilisation in the camera. So once you've shot your footage with a high shutter speed, you'll need to go and download and install Catalyst Browse from sonycreativesoftware.com. This will let you access the gyro data and stabilise the footage. So here we are in Catalyst Browse. The first thing you're going to want to do is navigate to the folder containing your clips. So I've got this gyro tuck folder here. This first clip was shot at 24 frames per second with a shutter speed of 1 50th of a second. So it's going to have the normal amount of motion blur. Also notice these icons here. This tells you that the clip contains some kind of stabilization metadata. So let's go and try and stabilize this first clip. To do this, just click the stabilization button down here. It will analyze the clip and then apply the gyro stabilization. So if I try and play this back, it might be a bit jerky at first. So the version on the right is the version with the stabilization applied in Catalyst Browse. You probably can't see it too well on YouTube, but because we shot it at the regular shutter speed, we're getting a lot of kind of crazy jerky motion. Let's just close this, come back to our clips. This clip on the other hand was shot with gyro stabilization in mind. And if we have a look at the metadata down here, it was shot at roughly 1 200th of a second. So a lot faster than 1 50th. So we won't get much motion blur in the clip. If we try and stabilize this version, it's going to look a lot better. We'll have a look at a full screen version in just a minute, but this version, because we shot it at a higher shutter speed, doesn't have the same amount of weird jerky movement. So you can see on the left is the original clip and on the right is the one with the stabilization added. Notice it's a bit zoomed in. You can tweak this by clicking the manual button here and then choosing a different cropping ratio. So you can zoom all the way out and zoom in a bit. You can play with this to get the right balance of stabilization and cropping. We're just gonna stick with auto for now. And once you're happy with it, come up to the top here and click this, what looks like a share button. This will give you some rendering options. You can come down to the bottom here and choose some different transcoding settings. So for example, you can choose from these render presets. Because I shot this video at 100 megabits a second, I'm gonna to choose to output it at 100 megabits per second. So once you're happy with all those settings, just click export down here. And you can see at the top here, it's rendering this clip. So once the footage is rendered, this is what it looks like. Notice that we don't have much motion blur, so it looks a bit unnatural with that soap opera TV effect. We'll go and fix that in just a moment. So here we are in Premiere Pro with the rendered clip imported into this timeline. And if I just play that, you can see that the clip is now stabilized once it gets going. There we go. So we've got the gyro stabilization applied. But notice it does look a bit jarring because we've got no motion blur because of the high shutter speed. So what we're going to do is actually use After Effects to add some motion blur back in. So I'm just gonna right click on the clip and choose Replace with After Effects Composition. This will open up After Effects for us. We'll just choose a name for the project. We should see our clip now in After Effects. What we're going to do is come up to the effects and we're gonna search for pixel motion blur. We'll grab this pixel motion blur effect and drag it down onto the clip. There's loads of things that you can change here. We've got the option to manually change the shutter angle, shutter samples and vector detail. I'm not going to worry about any of that. I'm just going to leave it as the default. Effectively, what this is going to do is it's going to add motion blur back into the video. Once you're happy with that, I'm just going to click save and close After Effects to head back to Premiere Pro. So I'm just going to render this and here's what it looks like in full screen. And here's a side by side with and without the extra motion blur. When you're using this camera, you can choose from lots of different picture profiles and they all record video that looks slightly different. Some of these picture profiles record video that you can use basically straight out of the camera without needing to edit the colors. Some of them do require some extra work in post-processing to make them look like an image you'd see on a normal TV. Also, all of these different picture profiles have slightly different exposure requirements. Let's start with an overview of all of these different picture profiles and their exposure requirements, and then we'll dig into the S-Log3 picture profile in a bit more detail. First, we'll look at how to reduce noise by choosing the right base ISO for the picture profile you're using. Next, we'll see what modes give us the most dynamic range. And finally, we'll see how to set zebras for the different picture profiles to avoid overexposing important things in the scene.
The principles I'm going to talk about in this video apply to all Sony cameras, and I'll be using the Sony a7S III in the examples. Each of the different picture profiles or gammas, such as Cine 1 or S-Log3, have different base ISOs. A base ISO is where the camera produces the cleanest image with the least noise. Take a look at this footage, which was shot in S-Log3 at the base ISO of 640. This is from an A7S III. You'll need to search online to see what the base ISO is for your specific Sony camera. Notice that the noise is pretty good here. The A7S III actually has a second base ISO. For S-Log3, it's at 12,800 ISO. Take a look at this footage, which was shot at just under the second base ISO at 10,000 ISO. Notice how much noisier this is compared to 640 ISO. Let's now switch to ISO 12,800. Notice that this second base ISO, the noise is so much better. All those three examples were shot using S-Log3 and overexposing by about one and two thirds of a stop. Different picture profiles or gammas have the ability to capture a greater or lesser range of lights to darks or highlights to shadows. This is known as the dynamic range. You can see in this table here, sorted from best to worst, that the picture profile or gamma you use will greatly affect the final image. A wider dynamic range can potentially give you a more cinematic looking image with more shadow and more highlight details. These numbers for usable dynamic range are figures published by Gerald Undone, who by the way is one of my favourite YouTubers at the moment, and you should definitely check out his video as he goes into so much more detail. I'll put a link to his awesome video in the description below. There are some differences in colour accuracy with these different picture profiles, and also some of them like S-Log2 and S-Log3 require more time in post-production editing to get them to look good. The final thing we're going to talk about in this video is the different zebra settings for the different gammas. Different gammas will clip the video signal at different levels and result in blown out highlights. You can set the zebra level in your camera by using one of the preset values or choosing a custom value. In the A7S III menu, you can find the zebra settings here. So now you know that anywhere these zebras appear will be blown out and you'll lose details in those highlight areas. As you can see from this chart, the maximum zebra point is different for the different gammas, with some even exceeding 100. This means the whites can go above 100 and then be pulled down in post. S-Log3 is a gamma curve which records data from the camera's sensor to try and capture the widest possible range of lights to darks in the image. Sony themselves describes S-Log3 as having characteristics that represents scanned film. It does however require some additional post-production editing or colour grading to translate it to more normal looking footage that can be displayed on a TV or monitor. Colour grading S-Log3 footage is a big topic so I won't be going into too much detail in this video, but if you want to see a future video on colour grading S-Log3, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications. If you are shooting in S-Log3 on the Sony A7S III, then you'll probably want to shoot in 10-bit 422 colour, just so you can maintain as much quality during colour grading. Because when you're shooting in S-Log3, you're always going to have to do some colour correction or colour grading work in post, you can set your exposure in camera during shooting to take full advantage of the benefits of S-Log. And that's what the rest of this video is about. So what creates noisy looking S-Log3 footage? Well S-Log3 doesn't necessarily have any more or less noise than other gammas or picture profiles. When shooting S-Log3 you want to make sure your exposure is as high as possible above the noise floor of the camera. The noise floor is basically where the camera sensor starts to introduce the most noise into the image. If your exposure is set too low and it's in the noise floor area then you'll see more noise when you colour grade. Especially if you're going to try and raise the shadow areas during colour grading. If you're using the official Sony LUT to convert S-Log3 to Rec. 709, then the LUT expects a certain exposure to work optimally. I'll put a link in the description below to the official Sony LUT, just so you don't have to search for it yourself. The official Sony LUT expects zebras to show on an 18% middle grey card when the zebras are set to 41% in camera. The problem with this is sometimes if you set this exposure up, 41% zebras on a middle grey card, then you're going to get some noise in your footage. This is most likely when you have a dimly lit scene or a scene with a lot of contrast, especially where you'll have shadow areas that fall in the noise floor area. 
The solution to this is to actually overexpose where middle grey is by setting your zebras to something like 55%. Basically you want to aim for about one to two stops of overexposure in your S-Log3 footage. For every 8% you add to your zebra value, you're adding about one stop of exposure. So one stop above 41% zebras will be 49% zebras, and two stops above middle grey will be 41% plus 8% plus another 8%, which will be 57% zebras showing on an 18% middle grey card. As a general rule, if you want to overexpose S-Log3 to reduce noise, then set your zebras to 55% so that they show on a middle grey card. Also, to minimise the possible noise, you should shoot at one of the two base ISOs on the Sony A7S III. So that's 640 ISO or 12800 ISO. One compromise to be aware of, however, is that if you overexpose middle grey, you might actually reduce the total dynamic range available to you. I'll show you an example of this later in the video. So here we are in Premiere Pro, let me just make this a bit bigger. And you can see I've got some test shots shot in the studio here. So this first shot was set at 41% middle grey. And you can see up here I've zoomed in 400%. If I just play this back full screen, you can see a little bit of noise here. This next section was actually shot at 55% zebras on the middle grey card. I'll just play this back full screen without zooming in. And you can see the blacks in the background and the shadows are pretty noise free. If we zoom into this, the same 400%, you can see that we don't have much noise in the shadows here. Once again, this is at 55%. Here's another example at 55%. And notice that the blacks in the background here and the shadow areas are pretty noise free. So basically what I've done here is I've used this middle grey section on this colour checker passport video. I've set the zebras in the camera to 55% and I've adjusted the exposure by brightening or lowering the key light until the zebras appear on this middle grey section here. So in this case we're overexposing middle grey because this should be set to 41% zebras. If we have a look at some side by sides and I'll just go full screen here. I'm just going to play this back in a second, but pay attention to the difference in the blacks and the shadows on the left compared to the right. On the left we've got the 55% zebra overexposure, and on the right we've got the technically correct 41% zebras for middle grey. Okay, let's play this back. And I hope you can see this with the YouTube compression, that you've got a lot more noise on the right hand side. Here's another example. In this case, I've boosted the shadows by plus 100 using Lumetri. And hopefully you can see some differences here. Pay attention to the side of my cheek here, and also the noise in the color checker. Let's just play this. And hopefully there you can see some differences in the noise, especially on my cheek area. The next clip here, what I've done is boosted the shadows by 100, and also the exposure by plus 1. So you might find yourself doing this if you want to brighten up the shadow areas or the exposure in S-Log3 footage. But notice what happens with the 41% Zebra version, we're getting a lot more noise now. And in the 55% Zebra version, we're actually getting a little bit of noise, but it's nowhere near as bad as the 41% version. Let's just play this back. And finally, in this side-by-side -side comparison, I've boosted the shadows by 100 and the exposure by plus 2. And straight away you can see a lot more noise in my cheek area here and also in the black background. Whereas with the 55% Zebra version, it's not as bad. I shot all these samples at the base ISO of 640. So in a controlled environment, indoors or in a studio, you can take advantage of the fact that you can actually shape and control the light, overexpose to 55% zebras, and then adjust the lighting accordingly. Let's take a look next at some of the different methods for setting exposure when shooting outside. So there's a couple of different scenarios you might find yourself in when shooting outside in daylight. In the first scenario you have an 18% middle grey card that you can make use of, and in the second scenario you might not have an 18% middle grey card with you. Let's take a look first at the examples where we do have an 18% middle grey card. Here I'm using this middle section of the Colour Checker Pro. If the scene is well lit then you might get away with 41% zebras on a grey card, and you could also check that nothing's clipping by setting the zebras to 94 and checking that there's no zebras in the image. 
So let's take a look at this first example. I'll just go full screen and play this back. The clouds are very slowly moving here. So this is ungraded footage with zebras set to 41% for middle gray. The meter was reading plus two flashing. And once again, this is at ISO 640. Next up, we've got the application of the official Sony LUT. And this is what it looks like with no additional color grading. This version is once again with zebra set at 41 with the official Sony LUT applied plus some additional color grading that I performed. And finally, I added some extra color grading just to try and reduce the brightness of the sky. I'll just pause it there for a moment. Notice that we've actually got some detail in the sky still. It's not completely blown out. So all of those examples were set with zebras at 41. Let's take a look next at zebras set to 55. Just go full screen and we'll just start playing this back. Once again, the clouds are moving very slowly. So this is ungraded footage. And this is what it looks like with the official Sony LUT applied. Just gonna pause it for a moment here. One thing to bear in mind is the official Sony LUT will expect middle grade to be at 41%. Here it's at 55%. So we might need to lower the exposure in post prior to applying the official Sony LUT. And you can see already that the sky is blown out here. Let's continue playing this. This is with the official Sony LUT applied and reducing the exposure prior to applying the LUT. This gets it more in line with what the LUT expects. Let's just keep playing. And this is with some additional color grading applied after adding the LUT. This version is once again applying some additional color grading with a mask to try and bring back the sky. But notice here that we can't actually recover hardly any detail in the sky. And that's because we've overexposed the image. So this is an important thing to bear in mind, even though the Sony a7S III with S-Log3 has a good amount of dynamic range, you're always going to have compromises. In this case, you need to ask yourself what the subject of the scene is. The subject in this scene is actually the color checker card here and not the actual background or the sky. So you can imagine a person in place of this color checker card. In that case, the person would probably be the subject in the frame and you'd want to expose that person correctly. Doing so with zebra set to 55 will mean that you'll blow out the sky here. So there's a compromise to bear in mind here when trying to remove as much noise from the subject as possible. And that's that you might blow out other areas of the image, such as the sky here. Let's take a look next at a side-by-side -side noise comparison. On the left is zebras set to 41 with the Sony LUT color grading and the sky grade applied. And on the right here is zebra set to 55. Once again, with the Sony LUT, some color grading and the sky grade. And you can see in this side-by-side -side example, the difference in the sky. In both of these cases, the exposure for the subject, the color checker card is correct. I'll just go full screen and play this back so you can see the difference. And I'll just skip ahead to this version when I've zoomed in 400% on the color checker card. So the version on the left was correct exposure with zebra set to 41 and on the right zebra set to 55. The focus is a bit different on the right, so I apologize for that. But you can see the noise difference. If I play this back, check out the noise in the shadows on the left versus the noise in the shadows on the right. Hopefully you can see that with YouTube compression. So even though the version on the right is a bit out of focus, there's a definite improvement in the noise with zebras set to 55. But as we saw in this version, with zebras set to 55, we're going to blow out the sky. The other scenario is that you're shooting outside and you don't have access to a gray card. Just gonna open up this other sequence. What I've done in this example is to set zebras to 92 in camera. The maximum is 94 for S-Log3, but I've set this to 92 to allow for a bit of safety in the exposure. Then what I did is I exposed it so that the sky just starts to have zebras appear and then lowered the exposure a tiny bit so the zebras just disappear. This will basically expose the image as hot as possible, which will also raise darker areas further away from the noise floor. Alternatively, in an evenly lit scene where the camera meter will give you a pretty good reading, just adjust your exposure until the meter reads between plus 1.7 and plus 2.0 non-flashing and have your zebra set to 94 so you know if anything is going to be overexposed. So this version is with zebra set to 92. This is set to 92 with the official Sony LUT applied without any color grading. Just have a look at this playing back full screen. This is with the official Sony LUT plus some additional color grading applied. And this is with the additional sky grade. So this looks a bit unrealistic, a bit HDR like, but you can see that we've got a lot of detail in the sky still. In this example, I set zebras to 55% and then I adjusted the exposure. So zebras mostly covered my face. This is the ungraded version. 
This is with the official Sony LUT only. This is with the official Sony LUT plus some additional colour grading that I added. And this is grading using the Film Convert Nitrate grading plugin. So basically if you're shooting outside and your subject is a person, set your zebras to 55% and then adjust your exposure so the zebras just start to cover most of the face. So what about if you're shooting at night? I've got this test footage here that I shot at this harbour. This first version, this is ungraded and I've set the exposure using the meter only. And I've set the meter so it reads 0, 0.0 at ISO 12800. This is ungraded footage. You can see a little bit of noise in the sky. Let's have a look at this footage that's been graded just using the official Sony LUT. Doesn't look too bad. And we've got this version that's using the official Sony LUT plus a little bit of extra color grading. Sorry about the wobbling of the image. It was pretty windy when I was shooting this footage. Here's a zoomed in version at 400% and you can see a little bit of noise here but we are at 400%. Next I tried to overexpose this scene so I set the zebras at 92% and adjusted the exposure until the zebras just started to appear on those bright street lights and then backed off the exposure a little bit so the zebras disappeared. To get this exposure I had to boost the ISO up to 32,000. So we've moved away from the second base ISO of 12,800 here. So we're going to get a little bit more noise just from the ISO. This is the ungraded footage. And this is the footage graded just using the official Sony LUT. You can see a little bit of noise in the orange glow in the sky at the right hand side here. This version is with the official Sony LUT plus a little bit of extra colour grading that I applied. And if we have a look at this version, this is zoomed in 400%. And you can see a bit more noticeable noise here. For this next version I used the camera meter and I overexposed using ISO until I hit a value of plus 1.7 on the meter. To do this I had to boost the ISO again to 64,000. So once again we're moving further away from that second base ISO so we're going to get more noise. If we just play this back this is the ungraded footage. There's definitely a bit more noise now. This is the same footage with the official Sony LUT applied and you can definitely see more noise in the sky here. You can see a few more stars I think maybe. And this is the version with the Sony LUT applied plus some extra colour grading that I performed. And if we zoom in to 400% we can definitely see some noise, especially in the orange glow area on the right hand side. I've done a few side by sides just so you can see the comparisons. On the left here we've got ISO 12800 which is the second base ISO. This is the ISO in these examples with the lowest noise. In the middle we've got the zebra set to 92 and overexposed by plus 0.7 and on the right overexposed by plus 1.7. To my eyes the worst example here is the middle example where we've only overexposed by plus 0.7. If I just play this back so you can have a look at it in motion. Notice on the right hand version where we've overexposed by plus 1.7 even though we've had to boost the ISO again I think that this footage looks a bit better than the middle footage. Doesn't look quite as noise free as the left hand side though. I also shot some additional test footage of this ship. This is the ungraded footage. For some reason they chose a really horrible orange light to light this ship. Not sure why. This is 12800 ungraded meter reading of 0, 0.0. Looks pretty good. Here's the same footage with the Sony LUT applied. Got that lovely orange glow. And this footage looks actually pretty nice to my eyes. This is the same footage just with a little bit of extra color grading. Once again I think this looks pretty good from a noise point of view. This version is ungraded and I overexposed to get a meter reading of plus 0.7. To do this I had to increase the exposure or the ISO to 32,000. There's definitely more noise in this version. But if we have a look at a graded version, it doesn't look too bad. But there's definitely a bit of noise in this one. And this is the same version with a bit of extra color grading. 
We've also done some side-by-sides -side of these shots. On the left is ISO 12800 and on the right ISO 32000. And if we zoom in, we can see the right-hand side definitely has more noise here. So I think this version, the left-hand side actually looks a bit better. I didn't actually perform this test at a meter reading of plus 1.7, so it would have been interesting to see how that compared. Just going to come back to the harbour version. So based on these results, if you're going to overexpose S-Log3 at night, you probably don't want to go much farther than 6400 ISO, otherwise you might get some ISO related noise. But if you are going to overexpose, you're probably going to want to make sure that you overexpose by about 1.7 and not just 0.7 as we can see in the middle here. This middle version definitely looks the worst to my eyes. So which picture profile should you choose? Well, if you want to use the video files that come straight out of the camera without needing to do any extra color editing work, then standard or s cinetone are pretty good choices. Just bear in mind if you use these, you're not going to be getting the maximum dynamic range that this camera is capable of. And dynamic range basically means how far into the dark or shadow areas you're going to see and how much of those highlight or brighter areas are going to be lost in the final video. As an example, let's compare s cinetone to S-Log3. The first thing to think about is ISO. The base ISOs for these two picture profiles are different. On the A7S III that I'm filming on now, S-Log3 has a base ISO of 640, whereas S-Cinetone has a base ISO of 100. That means if you're filming in bright daylight and you don't have an ND filter, and you also don't want to change the aperture or overcrank the shutter speed, then S-Cinetone in this example might be a better choice. That's because S-Cinetone's base ISO is lower than S-Log3's base ISO, so it's going to be a lot less sensitive to bright light. However, if you're filming in darker conditions then S-Log3 might be a better choice with its higher base ISO of 640. Also on the A7S III here the picture profiles have two base ISOs where the noise is at its lowest with S-Log3 having a whopping 12,800 for its higher base ISO. As Cinetone's higher base ISO is only 2,000. So for low light or dark situations S-Log3 might be the better choice especially if you're going to use that higher second base ISO. The second thing to think about is what colors you want and also your editing effort in post-production. You can think of s cinetone as having its own color grade built into the video file itself, which can either be a good or bad thing depending on your preferences. The good thing about s cinetone is that you can use the footage straight out of camera without needing to know how to do color grading. With S-Log3 on the other hand, you will have to do some color grading in your editing software if you want to use the footage properly. You can still do some color grading with s cinetone if you want to, but you don't have to. If you really want complete control over how the colors look and you don't mind doing color grading, then S-Log3 will give you a better starting point than S-Cinetone. S-Log3 is going to give you a more neutral starting point. Basically, if you want to record and get videos out as quickly as possible with little or no editing, then S-Cinetone is a better choice than S-Log3. The third reason you might want to choose S-Log3 over S-Cinetone is dynamic range. Dynamic range is basically the size of the difference between the darkest and the lightest parts of the image that you can capture in your video. The bigger the dynamic range, the more detail you can get in the shadows and highlights. If you want maximum dynamic range, then you'll want to use S-Log3. You can see here that S-Log3 gives you more dynamic range than S-Cinetone. See how there's more detail in the sky here. If you decide you don't want to use S-Log3, but you don't quite like the color or the look of S-Cinetone, then you could maybe try picture profile off with a creative look of standard or neutral if you want that quick editing turnaround and you don't want to do color grading. The S-Cinetone picture profile is designed to give you movie-like colors straight out of the camera with no color editing required. If you do decide to use S-Cinetone, there's a few different ways that you can set up your exposure. Let's take a look at this next. S-Cinetone gives you cinematic looking footage straight out of your camera with pleasing skin tones with no color grading required. You can just go into the picture profiles and see if you've got picture profile 11. If you don't see picture profile 11 showing up, then you'll probably need to go and update the firmware on your camera. Just head over to Sony and follow the instructions. So once you've updated the firmware, head into the picture profiles and choose picture profile 11. This is the S-Cinetone picture profile. The next thing you want to do is set your ISO. The base ISO for S-Cinetone on the A7S III is 1. 100. And if you're shooting at night time or in low light, you might want to choose the higher native base ISO, and that's ISO 2000. You should use these two ISOs for the best possible noise performance. So now you've got your camera set up, let's look at the four different ways you can set your exposure when using S-Cinetone. 
The easiest way to set your exposure for S-Cinetone is simply by using your eye, using the viewfinder or the screen on the back of the camera, and judge the exposure by what you see. Unlike some things such as S-Log3 which requires colour grading in post, you can use S-Cinetone footage straight out of the camera. So what you see in the viewfinder or on the screen is a good indication of what you'll actually get. This first method also means you don't have to worry about going into the menus and setting up zebras. This makes it super quick to shoot with S-Cinetone, but you might end up overexposing or underexposing skin tones or blowing out and clipping important highlights. One disadvantage to this approach is that if it's a really bright day, you might not be able to see the screen properly and you might not be able to judge the exposure correctly. In this case, you could always go and use the electronic viewfinder instead. The second method is basically the same as the first method, except this time we're going to use zebras to check that we're not blowing out or clipping important highlights. Just set your custom zebras to 109 plus using the lower limit zebra mode. Set your exposure based on what you see in the viewfinder or on the screen, and then just reduce your exposure if you see zebras on any important highlight details. The next simplest method is to just use the meter in the camera. Adjust your exposure until the meter reads 0.0 .0 and then just hit record. No meter is perfect so in a heavily backlit scene or a bright scene such as a beach or snow you might get an underexposed image just relying on the meter. You can try overexposing or underexposing based on the meter to get different looks. One of the benefits of S-Cinetone is the nice skin tone colours it can produce straight out of camera. If you've got people in your shot, you'll probably want to use this next method to make sure your human subjects look good. This method makes use of zebras and you'll want to set your zebras to 65. To set this up, head to your camera zebra settings, choose custom, standard plus range, set the range to plus or minus 3, and set the zebras to a value of 65. Now simply adjust your exposure until you start to see zebras on the brightest parts of your subjects' faces. Depending on the look and the mood that you want to create, and also on your subject's skin tone and complexion, you might want to try and set zebras at 55 or 60 for a darker and more contrasty image. Or you can go the other way and set your zebras somewhere between 70 to 75 for a brighter, flatter look. Zebras at 55. There's a little bit of highlight, a little bit of zebras there. Meter reading minus 0.7. Right, this is zebras at 65%. A little bit of zebras there and a little bit there. Okay, this is 75 zebras here, a little tiny, tiny bit there. All right, this is zebras at 109 plus, whatever it is. And I've just, there's just a very tiny, tiny, tiny bit of zebra there, but basically no zebras. So S-Log3 is the absolute best picture profile to use on the A7S III if you want to get the maximum dynamic range out of the camera. It does however mean that you'll need to do some additional colour grading work when you edit your video. Let's see how to do that next. We're going to jump into Premiere Pro in just a minute, just give you a quick overview of what we're going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to use Lumetri Colour to apply the colour grading effects and we're going to actually use multiple instances of Lumetri. We're going to use them for different purposes. This will form a chain of processing for colour correction and colour grading and it'll help you to organise what should go where. So let's head into Premiere Pro now and we'll have a look at this first clip. So here's a clip I recorded in the studio. The first thing we're going to do is in the effects here, we're going to search for Lumetri Colour and we're going to drag a Lumetri Color instance onto the clip here. And we can see it in the effects. I'm going to right click and rename and call this first Lumetri Color instance pre-CST. I'm going to go and add a second Lumetri Color instance here. Once again right click and rename, call that one CST. Add a third instance, call this one post-CST. I'll explain what these are going to be in just a minute. We'll add a fourth Lumetri Color instance called Grade and finally a fifth instance and we'll call this Sharpen. Just going to expand the program window a bit more so you can see it a bit better here. And we're already in the color workspace and you can see in the Lumetri color panel here we've got all of our Lumetri instances. So this first pre-CST Lumetri instance is going to be used for correcting any exposure differences before applying the official Sony LUT. This version of the clip was shot with zebras at 41% on this middle grey section here. So this is about the correct exposure for the LUT. In the second Lumetri color instance here we're going to apply the official Sony LUT. You can find this official Sony LUT at the Sony website here. What you need to do is come down to Sony LUTs, click on download Sony look profiles and click download here. 
Once it's downloaded, you'll get this folder, which contains these four LUT files. These first two will convert slog 3 sgamut 3 cine into REC 709. Notice that these have got the LC in the file name. This stands for low contrast, so we'll have to add some contrast back in after applying the LUT. So once you've downloaded this LUT, make sure you're in the CST Lumetri instance. And in the basic correction input LUT here, just choose Browse and select this sgamut 3 cine slog 3 to LC709 LUT, open that, and you can see straight away the image is looking a lot better. That's because we exposed it correctly in the first place. If I go and add the crop effect to this clip, and I'll just adjust it until we can see these three exposure bars. And if we come over to the Lumetri scopes, you can see this middle bar is roughly at 41% here. And that's the correct exposure for S-Log3, or at least the correct exposure for the official Sony LUT. Just going to disable the crop effect. So once we've applied the official Sony LUT, remember that we did that in the CST Lumetri instance. We can now move to this post CST Lumetri instance. Here we're going to add some contrast back into the image. We're going to tweak the exposure if we want to, and we're also going to perform any color correction that we need to do. So let's start off with adding some contrast back in. I'm gonna set this probably somewhere around 26. This is a matter of personal taste. We can also go and correct any exposure. If I re-enable this crop and head back to Lumetri scopes, for this color checker card, we want middle gray about 41%. We want this white strip to be somewhere around 90, and we want this black strip here to be somewhere in the zero to 10% range. So for example, what we could do in this post CST Lumetri instance, we could modify the exposure. Just gonna do this very quickly. So we could bring up the whites here if we wanted to. That's also going to raise middle gray a bit though. Or we could use the curves here to do the same kind of thing. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. And if we undo the crop and toggle this off and on, We'll toggle the entire post CST Lumetri instance. We can see the difference in exposure there. We can also use this post CST section to do any color correction. I'm going to re-enable the crop and I'm going to change it so we can see these color chips. And if we head back to Lumetri scopes, I'm going to enable the vector scope YUV. So because we've got the color checker, we know roughly where these things should be. These lines should point towards their respective colors and they should all be about 50% between the middle and this box here. You can see that red might be skewed a little bit. You can see that magenta here might be skewed a little bit. Blue's looking okay. Green's looking maybe a bit skewed and cyan's looking okay too. So we can use the hue saturation curves and the hue versus hue curves to make any changes for color correction. What I'm going to do is put points in at each of these intersections here and also in the hue versus hue section here. So let's start off with the red. I'm going to hold down shift and move this red point up and down. Holding down shift just makes it move vertically up and down and it won't accidentally go left or right. And you can see if we increase the exposure, red is shifting a little bit to the left. We can do the same thing in the hue versus hue, once again holding shift and we can just where that red line fits. We also want to make sure that it's about halfway between the center point, which is probably somewhere about there. Let's do the same thing for magenta. I'm going to increase the saturation. And you can see that it's traveling a bit to the left of this box. You can use the hue versus hue just to bring it back in line and then bring this down to about halfway between the middle and the box. If we have a look at the blue, I'm just gonna increase the saturation. This is traveling fairly well. So we'll just try and get it about halfway across and we might need to just very subtly tweak it, something like that. Cyan is looking like it's lining up quite nicely, hitting the box bang on. So we'll adjust it so it's about halfway between the middle and the box. Next, have a look at green. This is traveling a little bit to the left of the box. So we'll just bring that around a little bit and just check it with the hue here about halfway. Maybe just tweak it a little bit more. The cyan looks like it's a little bit too far out. So we'll just bring that in a little bit to about 50%. And we'll also adjust the hue down here just so it lines up a little bit better. Just gonna increase the saturation so it can line it up a bit better and bring it down to about halfway between the center and the box. Let's come back to the effect controls and disable the crop. And I'll just toggle off and on this curve section. And I'm actually going to just tweak this tiny bit there. And now in this post CST Lumetri color instance, we've added some contrast, we've tweaked the exposure and we've performed color correction. There's a couple more Lumetri color instances here. The next one in the chain is this grade. This is going to allow us to perform any artistic grading that we like. 
Then this final one is going to add some sharpening. So you want to add sharpening at the last point in the chain. So you can play with what amount of sharpening you like. I'm typically at the minute applying about 15 to S-Log3 footage. So in this grade section, we can pretty much go crazy if we want to. We could use one of these creative LUTs built into Lumetri Color. We could add some saturation or remove some saturation and a vignette and any other creative artistic changes that you want to make. In this second clip, I've actually overexposed this S-Log. Basically, I've exposed this gray bit here at 55% zebras. What I'm going to do is right click this first clip and choose copy and come down to the second clip and choose paste attributes. We're going to make sure all of the Lumetri instances are checked and also the crop and we'll just apply that. What I'm going to do is leave the sharpening as it is. I'm going to reset the grade instance going to reset the post CST instance. Going to leave the CST as it is. This is where we've applied the Sony LUT. But we're going to actually use this pre CST instance now to reduce the exposure before it hits the LUT. Let's start off by turning off the LUT. Just disable this Lumetri instance. Come back to pre CST. And once again, we'll make use of the Lumetri Luma waveform. To make this a bit easier, once again, we'll use the crop. And notice this time, middle gray is not at 41%. It's kind of almost at 55%, which is the zebras that I set. So what we need to do is we need to bring this middle gray exposure down to about 41% before we apply the LUT in the next part of the chain. To do this, I'm just going to use the exposure here and bring this down to about 41%. Come back to effect controls, turn off the crop and come back to the CST instance and re-enable the LUT transform. We can now continue with the same steps we did before. We can add some contrast, perform any color correction and any exposure tweaks. To save time, I'm not gonna bother color correcting this footage. And then in the grade, we can apply some kind of creative style if we want to. For example, we could add some faded film effect here, increase the vibrance, looks pretty horrible. And then once again, the final step is this sharpening, which is set at 15 at the minute. One of the other things this pre-CST instance is for is to set the white balance if you need to. The final clip we're going to look at is this outdoor clip. Once again, I'm going to right click, choose paste attributes, paste all the Lumetri effects and the crop. Olive sharpening enabled, I'm going to disable the grade, disable post CST. We'll leave the color space transform active and we can also make some changes in this pre-CST. So for example, we could change the white balance here. I could try doing this by clicking the eyedropper or I could do it by eye something like that. Then in the post CST, once again, post CST, we could add some contrast. In the grade section here, just reset that. We can do something creative. So I'm going to go and add some saturation in. But notice I can't pull down the highlights here in the sky. What I could do is come back to the pre CST transform and drop the highlights here. And that just offers you a different approach. Once again, this grade section is for more artistic or creative choices. So we could do something like this. So that's a five step process to color grading S-Log3 footage. Start off with this pre-CST Lumetri instance. In here, do white balancing and any exposure correction, such as bringing middle gray down to 41 IRE. In the CST Lumetri color instance, just apply the official Sony LUT. In the post CST Lumetri color instance, once the LUT's applied, you can add some contrast, tweak the exposure and perform any color correction. And now you've got correctly exposed and color corrected footage. In the grade instance here, you can go to town and get artistic. And the final step is to sharpen the footage. If you're wondering what CST stands for, it's an acronym that stands for Color Space Transform. And it's basically converting one color space or one picture profile, if you like, such as S-Log3 into something like Rec 709, which is what the standard definition TVs use. For an even easier way to color grade S-Log3 that tries to simulate those Hollywood blockbusters, you can use a specific LUT. The first thing you need to do is make sure you're shooting in S-Log3 and S-Gamut3 Cine. For example, on the Sony a7S III, this will be picture profile eight. Next, head over to the Sony Professional website and then scroll down and hit the download button. There's two different downloads that you can choose here, the 33X or 33 grid versions, which you might have to use. And there's also the 65X or 65 grid versions, which are gonna offer you better quality. So what I would suggest is download the 65 versions first. And if you have any problems in your editing software, then you might have to revert back to the 33 versions. Once you've downloaded the package, open it and you'll see all of these cube files. These are the LUTs. I'll come back to what these file names mean in just a minute. You'll wanna copy these cube files from the zip file over to your computer somewhere. 
Next, you'll want to open up your S-Log3 footage in whatever video editing software you're using. The cube files should work in all major video editors. For example, in Premiere Pro, head over to the color grading workspace and in the Lumetri color panel, load in one of the cube files that you just downloaded. And bam, instantly you'll see your footage given that Hollywood blockbuster look. So which of these cube files should you be using for your footage? Depending on whether or not you have overexposed or underexposed your S-Log3 footage, you'll need to choose the appropriate cube file. So if you overexposed your footage by 1.5 stops, use the negative 1P50 cube file. This will reduce the exposure by 1.5 stops. And if you underexposed, for example, by one stop, use the plus 1P00 cube file to increase the exposure by one stop, and so on. So we've covered a lot of ground in this tutorial so far, and there's been quite a lot to remember. So what I went and did is created some free cheat sheets for the Sony a7S III that you can find more about in this video. Please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like the video, and I'll see you in the next one.